I don't know. I, I'm 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 partial to soccer because I'm passionate about it. I know when I was growing up, we didn't have strong, confident female role models. I followed my big brother around. He's two years older than me, and was, whether it was playing street hockey, tackle football, you name it, I was always on his heels, dying to get in the game. Say you're going in the wrong direction because <laughs> it was halftime and we switched our, I love our direction that. and I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> and uh, I was on this like dead, like, you know, breakaway. You can get five coaches in the same room and we all thought five different opinions on maybe how Kerry Taylor was as a player. <laughs> I was a great I was a great player. And then when I got off the field, she would say you did so great. I loved watching you play. No matter, I could have the worst game of my life. And it was the president of the soccer, Deaf Soccer Association asking if I'd be interested in the in the volunteer job that was the head, head coach of the Deaf team. And I actually was extremely excited. I'm Carrie Taylor, and this is Women Talking Football. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. You are listening to Women Talking Football, presented by Soccer Nation. And I need to give a shout out to our affiliate, Soccer Loco and Kings Pro Custom Shin Guards. Today, we are joined by Lisa Berg. Lisa, welcome to Women Talking Football. Thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to call in. And pretty much what we do and what the show is about is we are looking to highlight all the great things that are going on within the game of soccer both here and and internationally so we usually start the show by asking the guests to tell us a little bit about their soccer background so can you give us a little scoop on your soccer background and then we'll get into the meat of the show yeah definitely well thank you for having me it's pleasure to connect with people passionate about the game. Um, For me, currently, I'm coaching club soccer in Minnesota, um, which is a very unique environment. I'm coaching at a Division III um, university and at Woodbury Soccer Club as well. Um, I'm also involved at our state level. I run um, D coaching license. I'm an instructor for that and work with our ODP system. Um, at the youth levels. Um, I also have my um, involvement in some international projects. I've been honored to be invited to do some sports envoys recently this year, which are sponsored by the U.S. um, Department of State. Um, And I've traveled to Vietnam recently and uh, Venezuela earlier this year. I also do projects um, with coaches in different countries, especially Uganda, Um, in a program called Growing the Game for Girls, which we really focus on providing opportunities for women to grow um, their lives using sport, using soccer. And kind of my background is I played Division I soccer, um, got right into coaching as as a student athlete, and I've always had a passion and heart to kind of give back um, to the game and to people all the privileges I've gotten growing up in in the United States, playing soccer, um, getting access to education and all that. Fantastic. So you played at the University of Minnesota, correct? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I played I at the I, I played at the University of Michigan. So we're, we're fellow Big Ten athletes. So I, I love the Big yeah. Ten. So it's great. Um, so you mentioned that you got involved in coaching while you were in college. How, how did that come about? Did you have a coach that said, hey, Lisa, you, I think you'd be a great coach? Or, you know, what kind of piqued your interest in, in coaching? Well, I definitely came from a very small community in northern Minnesota, in Duluth. Um, there weren't a lot of um, educated coaches. And, you know, they were all, they coached hockey. And they came over to the (laughs) soccer side. So um, I did have a community, though, a coach in high school, Sean Road. um, He really gave us opportunities if we wanted to. So in the summers, always it was an opportunity to, you know, make some money, but also use this exposure I had to high level coaches Mm -hmm. um, and playing environments to kind of give back uh, to youth in my kind of remote 
community. So that's why I started. And then I think I was mentored by a lot of really amazing um, people, Mm -hmm. including Mickey Denny Wright, who came in to the University of Minnesota, um, just a hard nosed, passionate women empowerment, um, really role model. And then um, locally, I actually um, grew up with East Select Soccer Club, and we had lots of mentorship um, from different coaches. And they actually brought in um, different English coaches. And (laughs) one of them is currently the head coach at the Boston Breakers. Awesome. So uh, (laughs) I've been really, I think, um, lucky to have mentors that um, have provided me with empowerment. But I think also um, me, myself, I've had to, you know, accept it and, and be willing to learn and grow because of feedback. Right. And I think that's helped me also um, find passion and, and grow, grow in, in the field of coaching. Right. So you sound, you have a lot going on, <laughs> which is, which is awesome. And I, and, <laughs> and, you know, I think that's part of the, the passion that we find within soccer, it seems like, you know, we don't, we don't just want to stay in one little area and, and just, you know, work in our communities. It's like, what can I do here? What can I do there? You know, how can I help grow the game? And, and specifically for women, um, I think that's important. And you mentioned you're an instructor for the D license. And I, I've, you know, been an instructor as well. And that it's definitely we're we're in small numbers. So can can you talk a little bit about like how important it is to get more women to be instructors? Yeah, I think you know. I know you've you mentioned to me and that you had Nicole Nicole Lavoy, yes. Dr. Nicole Lavoy, on the show. Um, she is doing amazing research, just talking about um, you know that that glass ceiling of women becoming in higher positions, not just in sport, um, but in all areas. And I think the funny thing is the first coaching course I ever instructed was in Uganda in 2004 in 2012, Mm -hmm. because the head coach of the national team and I were the only licensed coaches officially by, you know, a FIFA standard license um, at the time in their whole country. Wow. Um, <laughs> and so two women led the first coaching course in that whole country. Um, and it opened my eyes first of, oh, I have I have some knowledge that I can mm-hmm. give back that other people don't have. Right. And two, yeah, two, what what an amazing um, role I could have in these coaches who are high level um, coaches that are going to impact thousands of kids over their mm-hmm. career yep. and yeah having a woman be your instructor is is a privilege that men don't understand they get that they get to have an instructor that looks like them yeah. um so giving the women someone that looks like them to role model them um is great but it also gives men i think this ability to see women in a different way mm-hmm. um to see them for their knowledge of the game and then it also, I think, creates this respect for, um, you know, I am not going to coach like John Smith over here. Right. I'm Lisa Berg. And yep. so um, it gives, I think, our coaching population the ability to see, hey, diversity is OK in our coaching world. And actually, diversity helps us mm-hmm. and helps our game. So I think it's really important we get involved. I'm not I always say I'm not there to because I, I'm the best. I'm not showing off. I'm there because I think it's really important that people see, you know, a different person instructing and a different style to do things. And I, and I've really worked hard to, you know, get knowledge that I want to give back. Right. But it, it's, it's tough though. It's really tough to be at that top um, level because people haven't seen it before and you have to, prove yourself yeah when you're in those positions I'm sure you've felt the same way yeah and and that's the one thing like you know I I teach E's and D's and, and the national youth license and I usually you know it, when there's women in the course which there's usually a small handful I always try to you know talk to them and say like hey do you have any questions like you know let's talk about the challenges and I always get asked the question, like, is there anything that always happens? And the advice that I give is, is that, 
you know what, no matter what, anytime you walk into a situation, if you're the instructor, you still have to reprove yourself to the group. Like it's, you, you know, as soon as you, you can impart that, you know what you're talking about, then you get their respect, but you don't necessarily mm-hmm. have their respect when you walk in the room and say, Hey, I'm your, you know, e-license instructor for the day. Sometimes you get like a sideways look. And that's the thing that I had to embrace was, okay, I can't get pissed off that I have to reprove myself every time. I just have to know that and, and like go in and kill it and be like, Mm -hmm. okay, you know, like here I am. What, what was the problem? Why, why were you looking at me sideways when I walked in, (laughs) you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's that, you know, I don't know if it'll ever change in my lifetime. (laughs) I would like to think it would, but, you know, I really feel strongly about, you know, and you mentioned Dr. Lavoy earlier, the, the She Can Coach initiative, you know, just n- looking around and saying, hey, yeah, like it's, it's a norm. It should be a norm. It shouldn't be like, oh, there's only two women out there on a Saturday on the fields. It should be, oh, wow, look, there's 20 women out there. Um, yeah, and I think that um, is going to be really important. An amazing, I just had amazing conversations with, you know, Linda Hamilton when we were on our recent trip, Mm -hmm. just because she's done a lot of pioneering in top, you know, administrative levels. And we have such an amazing population of former national team players, you know, educated women with their masters and doctorates that can coach our our young people, you know, but what system are we kind of growing in the United States? Because... I've seen development in these in third world countries in these underdeveloped countries in their women's coaching, um, you know, leadership mm-hmm. that there's something, some barriers that are happening in the U S mm-hmm. that, um, I think need to be really looked at. Um, and, and I think it starts also with, yeah, coach education and, and seeing it's okay to be a woman and to be a coach and, it's hard when you're going through those coaching courses to really believe it. You feel second rate when you're surrounded, you know, by 45 candidates and you're the only woman there. You yeah. think, Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You kind of look around and go, okay, <laughs> I got, mm-hmm. I got this. I got this. Okay. Let me tell myself I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, people like you are, are continuing to, to change and grow the game. So, you know, I really, I appreciate everything <laughs> that you're doing here and, internationally so let's talk about first um your your programs growing the game Mm -hmm. for girls and how that came about and some of the wonderful things you've been able to do through that yeah um so in 2006 as I was leaving college one of my professors um Dr. Jen Tom Lee He wrote a grant um, from the University of Minnesota to have us do a coach education program in Uganda. Um, He started the International Sport Connection. And the the idea was that um, youth that are at risk, if they have interactions with a caring adult mentor, they have better life outcomes. Mm -hmm. And in a country like Uganda, where we got the grant, so many of um, the parents and the Older generations had been removed from communities um, because of war and disease that his vision was to have these coaches become the mentors and the caring adults in their communities. Mm -hmm. Um, So his vision kind of carried to me, of course, and this idea of, you know, let's let's try to inspire coaches, not just to know the game and how to teach the game, but understand pieces of life Mm -hmm. and how you can help a child to become a better member of society, have, be able to maintain relationships and so on. Um, and at that course, I met Majida Nantanda, who's the head coach of the national team. She had recently retired from playing to become the first woman and the first women's national team um, coach of the under 20 team. Mm-hmm. And her and I just hit it off. I mean, it, you, you know, Anyone that has gone to another country and met another soccer player or coach understands this idea that, wow, we're just, we're just on the same level when you connect with someone through sport, it's just, you know, you, you feel like you've known them your whole life. Mm -hmm. And, um, so we went off of that platform and the idea that she was seeing, there's so many, 
um, rural communities in Uganda that that didn't have access to soccer, um, but had passion for it. Um, and she saw that her country was was developing in terms of women were getting some technology and electricity in their villages. So they didn't have to spend so much time um, in the home. Mm -hmm. They had some more time for recreation. So we kind of all those um, converged into this idea of let's let's advocate for more opportunities for women in sport. So meeting with schools, meeting with the federations to provide leagues and and I, um, opportunities for teams. Um, and then at the same time, just working with some of the top players with the national team players and talking about the importance of education and, you know, these opportunities that will emerge down the road, it's probably not going to be a professional soccer contract, but it could be, you know, an administrator for a club. It could be other things that you combine education with. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where our program emerged. And now we, we do clinics and, and coaching courses for coaches, men and women who want to get involved. Um, pretty much half to 60% are males that um, want to get involved in coaching women and girls, which is really important. I think that they're a powerful voice that help women even get further. Um, and then we also do mentorship for national team players. So as they're in the national team and as they're retiring, we try to look at what they want to do with their lives and, and connect them to different nonprofits, to different businesses, um, and maybe give them skills um, to be um, even higher candidates in those areas. So it's a continuing um, program that we're doing there. And I think a lot of countries, because they're trying to develop the game for women, um, they're also interested in, in, in how things are done and how we can just mentor. But, you know, overall, it is just a network of friends trying to say, hey, I can I can do this. I know about this. I'll teach you this. And then um, everyone's working together for this greater good. And I think you see that in the U.S. too right now with the women equality movement that, you know, we're trying to do the best we can, like you said, help out where we can working together to to achieve these things that, you know, we feel like we're equal, feel like we have a chance to pursue our dreams and have hope. And that's kind of the vision of that growing the game for girls. Right. That, that, that's so amazing. All the different levels that, that you and Majita art have, you know, weaved in and something that you said, just really, I just wrote it down. It really stuck with me. You said it, it's basically a network of friends. And I love, I love that because that that's what I feel, you know, our sport is, and, and maybe other sports are that way. I don't know, but it's just so, because soccer is such an international sport, it's that, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can drop someone in the middle of any country. And if you, if, if they have like a Barcelona sticker on their car, <laughs> you have something instantly that like connects you. And, and it, you know, that network of friends is, is amazing and powerful. So that, I, I like that, that it's a network of friends. Yeah. I have to give credit. Um, my professor, Dr. Jen Tom Lee always had that basis because, you know, his, his vision was that a lot of things are so structured, um, and task oriented that you forget this relational piece. And it's like, you'll do anything for your brother or sister or best friend, but when it's your job, mm -hmm. you know, you want to clock in and clock out. So I think his, his influence in that kind of quote is important to, to acknowledge too. Right. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, and it, it speaks to the role of mentorship and, and how, mm -hmm. you know, your professor can give you that and then, you know, you've taken it and weaved it through your entire life and now you're making an impact internationally and, and everything like that. So ha has, have you and Majita thought about taking Growing the Game for Girls and doing it in other countries and saying like, here's, here's the blueprint of how, of the things that we've done. Can we, you know, can we share the information with you? Have you been in other countries helping them? Yeah. Um, so I think one of the really big success stories is that Majita's from Uganda, you know, grew up and has an amazing story that translates really deep into the coaches we work with and the girls we work with. So local people, local partners that have experiences and 
you know, have amazing histories of, of their resumes and things like that are, I think are important. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of our approaches has been um, to work with the same type of, of leaders in different countries. So in Kenya, um, we have worked with their former national team players, starting um, trying to talk to them about doing a mentorship group and leadership group for their former players. Um, and um, in South Africa and Swaziland, we've done the same, um, working with their, you know, their federations and their top women coaches. And then um, just a few other countries kind of starting the conversation. Mm-hmm. And I think this this idea of growing the game for girls is something I know Majid and I take everywhere we go. So I have a 16-year-old club team that I'm talking to them about, you know, what are you doing to, to give back, to grow yourself, to learn to take feedback, you know, um, to turn, learn to communicate. So I feel like the messages that we put in different countries can be applied to, you know, as small of a group as my local club team right. um, and then these other countries and just that idea of I think there's the wonderful thing about sport is it's competitive and and you want advantages and you want to <clears throat> get ahead um, but this idea that when you share knowledge you actually become you actually gain more mm-hmm. than it's a resource that actually grows when you give it And so every country we go to, they have their own specific cultural, you know, um, issues Mm -hmm. that are going to, that are, you know, I don't think we can just layer what worked in Uganda in Venezuela or Vietnam. Um, But you can layer this idea um, that, you know, you have to work together, network of friends, and you have to, you have to give back knowledge and share knowledge. I think one of the things I've learned a lot of power structures are in many countries because access to opportunities, access to knowledge, you know, literacy, all those things prohibit certain populations from, from, you know, having opportunities. Yeah. If, if you don't teach someone to read, they can't read the rules and right. you can tell them the rules. So um, <laughs> giving, I think, people the skills to do things on their own and give them the knowledge and then they do something with it is definitely something we've tried to spread in other countries. Yeah. Oh. Well, and I think that's the, the key <laughs> thing is I heard the, the term, you know, giving someone a hand up, not a hand out. And, you know, mm. it, uh, the biggest thing that I think maybe some Americans think is, oh yeah, I'm going to go over to a foreign country and I'm going to save the world. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like (laughs) we don't have all the answers and and that sharing knowledge piece and understanding all the different, you know, cultural beliefs and how, you know, we're not going to sell, you know, we're not going to go in and solve anybody's problem. We're going to help people understand how they can, you know, expand and, and solve their own challenges and, Mm -hmm. you know, by sharing knowledge and sharing information and, and, you know, working together to say like, well, here's, here's some ideas. Here's how, you know, we've gotten this problem done and, you know, what do you think and this and that and and working together, not going, oh, well, here's the way of, of the world and this is how it gets done. So. Yeah. And, and, you know, with friendship, you got to listen, you got to listen to the people you're working with and, I think if we go and talk instead of listening and understanding, it, it, it loses a layer of trust and um, relationship between the people you're working with. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned Vietnam and you traveled there pretty recently with Linda Hamilton, who, you know, the soccer so connected. It's, it's so funny how everything's connected. Linda was on my show last week and she's a former coach of mine and, and, she mentioned, you know, Carrie, you got to get in touch with Lisa. And, and it's wonderful because now, you know, we have, I have a bigger network of friends (laughs) that that all kind of know each other. So it's amazing. So tell me about your time in Vietnam and, and some of the, some of the things you encountered there. 
Um, it was my first time um, going to Asia. So I had a lot of notions of, um, oh, you know, what to expect in terms of food and, and culture and things. And it was just really wonderful. I think, you know, anytime you travel with, obviously, the State Department, I think that the interaction you have with people um, can can be more formal. Mm -hmm. But I thought for this trip, um, you know, Linda in particular just is so charismatic and able to break down, you know, any walls with humor and things. And I think both her and I really wanted to be intentional about um, listening to the coaches and to the kids and, and understanding what was going on in the country we were getting to visit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think by the end, we really did find that we connected with the coaches and um, finding they have a lot of wonderful things, discipline, um, you know, when they, when they decide to play, they're all in. And I think we met with some amazing coaches who are also going to be leaders in their community because they were chosen by the, their federations and their, um, you know, school systems to, to be a part of this training. So it was really fun to know that, you know, the work we did is actually going to be put to use over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was the first time I had gone on one of these trips where they said, first train the coaches and then empower them to work with the kids. Um, instead of, you know, like you said, go and go and meet the kids directly. Right. Well, I think the, the organizers definitely understood this idea that you empower coaches, you give those coaches, um, the knowledge, um, and some advice of what we've done before. Um, that, can last a lot longer and, and be heard for a lot longer of generations if you empower coaches. So it was really an amazing trip. We got to see obviously the whole country um, from the North to the South. And um, I definitely would love to go back and work, work with them. Although the language barrier was, was somewhat of a, a physical comedy at times. <laughs> Were the hand, <laughs> hand signals. Did you have an interpreter or was it, yeah, we had one interpreter and two energetic, um, charismatic coaches. So I think by the by the evening sessions, the interpreter um, was very sweaty, and, <laughs> and we, you know, I ended up doing some goalkeeping on the side without any translators because you just, you know, you yeah. just demonstrate and right, uh, which which is a wonderful skill to learn as a professional coach of. You know, our players just want to see it, not yeah. just hear it. So yeah. <laughs> um, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you make a good point that to, you know, players want to see it, not ne just necessarily hear it. And that's, you know, that's something as a coaching instructor, we try to get across to, to candidates is, Hey, like stop talking and, you know, <laughs> paint the picture, roll the ball out, like get, get kids moving. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Vietnam, it's that... Yeah, I, that would be an interesting, that would be a very, very, very interesting trip. So do you typically, um, do you typically work with kids when you, um, with the, with the State Department trips or was this your first, you said this was your first one with the State Department? I actually got to go to Venezuela last October. Okay. Um, and we did, um, you know, the, the vision for their programs was to work with um, youth from different communities. Okay. And they had organized um, teams and organized leagues in Venezuela. So we got the chance to work with some of those teams. Um, and then a part of it, they give us a lot of freedom. So trying to connect with the coaches that were there on the field um, was was part of that, that program. But we really wanted to work with the coaches and then through the coaches um, get with the kids. I think it can be really powerful that, you know, you do have this privilege, this privilege when you go as an American into different countries, mm -hmm. they just see you <laughs> in a lot of ways. And I think my, my kind of journey has been, okay, you feel guilty about these privileges at times, but how can we, you know, use our privilege to open doors for different people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of 
translates to a lot of areas in women in quality. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but, but this idea of if I stand in front of this whole school, these administrators, these people in charge of the Federation, and I say, Hey, look at this coach. Hey, look at this local coach you have right here. And I plan to help this local coach to become her best. Then when I leave, there is a chance. <laughs> There's a chance that they'll look at that local coach and see her as something different. Right. Because, you know, that's how we probably get to where we're getting professionally in, in coaching. Because someone once said, you know, Linda Hamilton once said, hey, you should talk to Lisa Berg. Right. So um, I think these programs are really great if you kind of highlight and also look at what people have and show them the resources and the people they have and what they should grow in their own country. I think that's kind of going to make them sustainable. Yeah. And I mean, and that's very true. And, and, you know, I've, I've worked with, I've been fortunate to volunteer for an organization called coaches across continents and I'll be mm -hmm. going to Uganda in a couple of weeks. So that's kind of, I'm excited because you're going to put me in touch with Majida and I can't wait to, to meet, her and you know just be around the Ugandan people and, and learn from them um, but last year I was in Zimbabwe and we had the opportunity to meet with female sport leaders from a multitude of sports and the woman that I was traveling with from coaches across continents you know they the, the group that was hosting us said hey we want you to meet with our female sport leaders and we were kind of like okay, let, let's do it. And we had a day and a half of meetings with leaders from cycling and judo and netball and soccer. And we just sat around and we, sh you know, we shared knowledge and we talked about forming like a women's committee for sport. Mm -hmm. And my favorite email that I got a couple months ago was, was from a gentleman who said, we've continued the committee and hmm. this coach is now working, you know, with a local club and she's the director of, of girls in sport. And this cycling coach is, you know, traveling to the world championships. And it was like, it was the best email I think I've gotten in a long time just to see, you know, sitting down and sharing that knowledge that, that they, you know, they were able to just say, you know what, we need to come together. You know, how can, how can we keep this going? And they, and they did it. And it's, and they got backing from the the sports commission from Zimbabwe. And, you know, it was just, it was so, it made me so happy just to say, you know what, like something, something we did is being continued. And I'm so excited that my new friends are pushing it forward. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think one of the amazing things is, is to, yeah, appreciate that process of becoming a pioneer. Um, I still think generationally, we're still close enough to that title nine passing to, you know, our mothers are, you know, aunties or what, who were impacted by introducing sports mm -hmm. in a, in an organized manner, funding them. So we do know the importance yeah. of changes and committees and, and all these things. Um, and so I think that that is something to keep the conversation. I'm sure you've talked about it a lot. It's, Title IX and, and making sure all the legislation, you know, in the U.S. stays, but, yeah. and then we help influence it in other countries. And, you know, you see it like in Rwanda where they passed a bill of 50, 50 percentage in, in their government offices. And, mm -hmm. and I saw it when we were touring their national leagues, they have for every men's program, they have to have a women's program for their professional league. And, um, it just changes the way things are done and how people see each other when you have those legal <laughs> yeah. setups. Yeah. The, the so. legal ramifications. And and I think mm -hmm. you bring up a good point with the, with the title nine. Um, you know, I think those of us that, that know what opportunities it gave women, we still need to continue to educate the mm -hmm. younger females coming through because, a lot of the younger players, they have, they have no idea. They're like, Oh, I thought it was always like this. Or, Oh, I thought, mm -hmm. you know, there were always 300 and some, you know, division one female soccer programs. And, and, 
you know, you, d you don't want to say, oh, well, look at w everything we've done, but we have to educate and remind people that we're not that far removed from, from really, you know, big things happening. I mean, I, uh, you know, I remember Minnesota because Minnesota, they went varsity in 92, fall of 92, and Michigan went in fall of 93. And like, I delayed my graduation so that I could play on the first ever varsity program. You wow. know? And so when Linda coached me, we fundraised money to pay Linda to be our club coach. And I mean, we, we would pass out programs at home football games. We would clean the basketball arena. We would go to local businesses and like get ads for a program booklet, like just because we wanted to play soccer. And, you know, I look back at that now as a 40 year old woman going, holy crap, what, you know, look at all the cool stuff we did. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, continuing to share that information with the younger generation and say, look, like you have to understand the history and you have to continue to push it forward so that you don't forget that we're not that far removed from from mm -hmm. where things started. Yeah. And I think when how we started talking about, you know, women in leadership roles, we're in the United States, especially we're still led by people that are not women, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, and people that are not minorities. And yep. so until you can, can break into that decision-making those decision-making roles, there's still a lot of work, it, work to be done for it to, you know, to make sure it lasts. Yeah. Um, and if there's only, you know, if there's probably a handful of us instructing courses and, you know, getting to higher leadership, I, that's not enough. <laughs> yeah. It's not enough to keep going up. And so I think, yeah, talking to younger generations in the U S is still really important to, to push us higher. Yeah. Higher and higher into leadership. Well, and you know, going back to, to the work that Dr. Um, Lavoie is doing, I, I think all of, you know, bringing in academia and bringing in, you know, those of us that are with boots on the ground and, and just continuing to create that network and be, active and in front of people and you know continuing the message <laughs> until until it's pushing those pushing the needle you know of the num yeah. of the numbers and you know and it, I, go ahead yeah and I've definitely met an ama some amazing people doing that work Dr. Lavoie um we with our program growing the game for girls Dr. Alicia Johnson um she did her PhD research on helping with um, our former national team players. Um, so you can, you can look her research up just their experiences. And then, you know, through her, we met Dr. Sarah Hillier and Dr. Ashley um, there at the university of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of their program. Mm -mm. Um, it's an amazing, you know, definitely someone to talk to their, their passionate leaders they've been funded from the u.s state department to run a program called global sports mentoring okay and they bring women it's an amazing program that they've built um, they bring women um, from all countries around the world um, to be mentored for one month in the united states by women in professional environments mm. it's sports marketing coaching um, a lot of different areas uh, but something definitely that's that's going on and really important work, like you said, on the academic side um, and, and growing leaders. So it's not just coaches doing it. Right. There's a lot of other people doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm going to look global sports mentoring. Okay. University program Okay. at the university of Tennessee, oh. Knoxville. Okay. Now well, that's good stuff. See, you're sharing some knowledge that I, <laughs> that I, that I didn't have that. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's yeah. the, that's the thing. There's so much, there's so much good that's going on out there, but it's, it's hard to know, like you have to get connected and you have to say, Oh, well, I know this person that's doing this in Tennessee and Oh, and there's this woman doing this in Washington. And, you know, like you said, it's continuing to grow that, that network of friends because mm -hmm. a lot of times as women, we feel like we're, we're, you know, fighting our challenges out kind of in the middle of nowhere by ourselves. So there's, yeah. That silo effect, and I think that's something that I've learned a lot about 
when you go into other countries and you have all these nonprofits doing the same thing, mm -hmm. but they refuse to work together because um, they just don't know each other are out there. Right. Or, you know, the local leadership worries that, okay, we're, if we share this nonprofit with another person, we're not going to get as much food. Right. We're not going to get as many t-shirts. And so that is another challenge of, of going to do international work of teaching the local people that it's not a resource war. Right. And it's, it's more about this greater vision. And I mean, it's not an easy subject to talk about because most program people in the U S have limited funding. So you're trying to prove yourself, but, right. um, I think there's something deeper to this women equality and, and using sport to, to help us get, you know, get growing in our lives and in, in, in sport that, that can kind of overcome those silos um, and we can work together. Right. So let's see what else. So when's your next international trip? Do you have one planned in the upcoming coming future <laughs> to fit in with yeah, your club there's... coaching and your college coaching <laughs> and all of that. I know. Yeah. There's definitely always something brewing. Um, I'm trying to get some connections down in, in Mexico. They, they recently kicked off their women's professional league. Yeah. I heard about that. Um, yeah. So I think there's a lot of potential to work with emerging leaders there um, in sport to mentor coaches that, you know, are, are taking on those teams. I think certain clubs have done a wonderful job of putting women as head coaches. Mm -hmm. And in Mexico, that's, that's pretty unique. Yeah. Um, and, and, and creating more of like a, a mentorship program for international players. Um, in Uganda, we'll be this fall working on to do another retreat with our, our national team players and then work with um, kind of getting into coaches with physical disabilities mm -hmm. and kids with um, different um, hearing impairment and different disabilities because we've seen how far giving space to a girl has gone. Mm -hmm. We want to try to say, okay, so you you used to hide your girls. Now you're just hiding, you know, kids in wheelchairs, kids with Down syndrome. Now let's see if we give them space to play sport, if parents will say, oh, right. maybe I had this all wrong. Maybe my child can, you know, be a part of society um, and start right on the soccer field. So we'll do a couple camps and um, maybe a, a course for some of those coaches this fall. That's that's kind of the work this year. Right. But it's there's a lot of other discussions going on too. <laughs> No, that's awesome. So how do you get, um, you mentioned originally that you, you got grant money for the growing the game for girls. Are, are you currently a nonprofit? Are you looking for, you know, how are you funded basically? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> Majita and I are the, you know, run around coaches. So we've had a lot of help, um, through the professor, Jens, Dr. Jens Lee, and he, um, started the International Sport Connection. Mm -hmm. It's called ISC Outreach. That is um, a nonprofit in the U.S. that has we can take some donations through, mm -hmm. um, and we write just really some small grants here and there. Uh, I know Majida has gotten the chance to be a part of the University of Tennessee program, mm -hmm. Global Sports Mentoring, um, which is also funded from the U.S. State Department. Um, and so she gets some small grants for the, the projects we do. Um, but a lot of the work we try to do is very low cost, mm -hmm. um, to try to down, you know, downplay this idea of resource, physical resource, and give us, um, just this blank slate of, we're just sharing our knowledge. Right. And, and Ugandans, they may not have their shillings in their pockets, but they have something they can pass on, you know, to a player or pass on to their community, even if it's not money. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting discussion for us because it's just like, you know, your, your family member inherits a lot of money, your relationship with them changes. 
Right. So <laughs> we still want to show the people we're working with that, hey, we're not profiting off of this. This right. is a, this is something, you know, we want you to profit from. Right. Um, so that's, you know, that's a work in proje- progress. But we do have an opportunity to to um, take funds and use them through a U.S. Um, nonprofit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we just have been pretty busy and <laughs> just doing the work that we haven't. Right. Um, grown our fundraising much (laughs) right so for you what where do you see yourself in like three years like what's your what's your goal um personally like profession professionally wise do you want to be a college head coach you know like what what's your aspiration short term that's that's a great question. That's probably why <laughs> you're still figuring it out. <laughs> I know I'm figuring it out. Um, I think there's some important things I want to make sure I have in my life, but you know, I have a deep faith and I think I'm being called to do certain things, but it doesn't, for me, it doesn't matter where I end up doing them. I think what's important is like my why, if you haven't read Simon Sinek's book, like, you know, start with why my why is, is, um, can I inspire and, and equip people to get hope and, and dream and become who they want to be and become a better version of themselves tomorrow. Um, so if I can find an environment where I'm mentoring others and, um, helping them find hope and belief that they're going to become better tomorrow, I'm good. Right. I'm good. Um, I love, I love working with elite teams. I really would love opportunities to coach, um, with in the U S for youth national teams and internationally, um, at the national level. And I, and I do also have a passion for instructing. So finding, you know, avenues to continue that work. I know our U S education programming is, is kind of changing and evolving, but, um, just to be, be a part of it um, to me would be amazing. Right. If that, that helps, <laughs> we can talk in three years and see really what happened. <laughs> well, and I think that's the, that's kind of the beauty of our sport is you can be involved in so many different areas and you almost, ha- you, you almost have to be, you almost have yeah. to, you know, if, if you're at a college, you know, you, you almost have to be coaching club or, or, you know, there's, there's so many different avenues that, that you can go into and, you know, it, 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 it draws you here and there and it, it, it expands your network of friends. I mean, I, I've been fortunate to travel to Hawaii and Alaska because a friend was like, Hey, do you want to do a coaching license in Hawaii? And I'm like, sure, <laughs> I'm in like no problem. And, and, you know, getting able to see different parts of the country and different parts of the world. Um, and, and like you said, sharing the knowledge, it, it's, it, our job is so different and it's not really a mm-hmm. job, you know, I don't consider what mm-hmm. I do a job, it, it, but it's so less than normal <laughs> than, than a, lo- <laughs> a lot of other jobs within society. And, and, you know, sometimes people don't take it seriously as a job. Like I can, I can recount a lot of times going, Oh, is that a full-time job what you do or, or you know is is do you get paid to coach and it's just like oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. You know, let me tell you, let me tell you about my job. <laughs> yeah. And I think another piece to being able to have these big dreams is is that mentorship. I work for Woodbury Soccer Club. Peter Rivard is is our DOC and he is all in. Mm -hmm. on the projects I do and so having I've learned you have to work for the right people yes very true (laughs) Um, which sometimes it's really difficult it it took me you know a long time 13 years of coaching um you know well 15 years of coaching to have the opportunity to choose who I work for right um I think in the U.S. we also have the privilege of being paid and making it a career, although mm. it's hectic. Yeah, <laughs> it is hectic. I, um, uh, you know, you it's a puzzle piece of a career, yeah. but it, you can you can at least live and eat right. as a soccer coach, which I just 
I wake up happy every day because of that. Yeah. Like you said, it's just, it's not a job. It's, it's a passion. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. So what, let's see, I always ask my guests a couple of, um, fun questions. So what is your favorite soccer moment as a player? kind of spin it another direction <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like a it's that that dangerous time where you are becoming a coach for so long you forget the player side of things that's that's not good but I definitely remember in high school playing games where you know it was I was a defender and coming in and clearing a ball off the line to win you know the semifinals and and go to state you know, that, that was a fun experience and amazing. I think, you know, at the University of Minnesota, I was, I was definitely challenged and given a chance to, to, to play with best players in my region and and country. And, um, you know, just the training environment of being around people that want to better themselves every day Mm -hmm. and are as good as you, if not better, all those, all those experiences kind of fueled this idea, this drive in me, like, I want to be the best, but I want to be the best amongst the best. And so I think being at the U gave me that chance to, to push my potential in an uncomfortable and very great way um, to, to be surrounded by people that challenge me. And then instead of feeling intimidated and scared, be fueled by it. Right. I think those experiences as play as a player, I think have helped me as coach as a coach. Yeah. I like that. Be the best amongst the best. That's, that's good. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm writing down some of these, these quotes. I love it. Like it's, 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 inspi- it's inspiring. You're inspiring me, Lisa. Oh, good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So now what has been your favorite moment as a coach? Tell me, or one of, one of the favorites, cause it's so hard to pick one. But, oh man <laughs> I know I'm putting you on the spot sorry <laughs> I, I do it to no, everybody <laughs> yeah no it's wonderful I would say hmm just, just go with your gut <laughs> yeah there's obviously winning is amazing right right but I think the ones that resonate with me are these like bigger picture moments And I knew my life was going to change at this coaching moment. When I went to visit Uganda for the first time, it was like the second day I was in Uganda, all my bags got lost. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Which happens. Walked on the field. I know, right? So carry your, here is a tip for you as you go to Uganda. Carry everything you need, like your cleats. In a backpack. Carry on. Yeah. So you won't, you'll get on the field. But um, walked on um, Stone Shimbadi. He has this Wolves soccer program in Uganda. Um, I hope you get connected to him um, when you're there. He had me stand next to him, introduce me to these men, age 18 to 30 years old, you know, Mm -hmm. um, coming from the streets, coming from different backgrounds. He said, men, this is Lisa Berg. She is a coach from the United States. And she's going to work with us today. And I, I was wearing a skirt. It, it was back in like 2008 where it was just really respectful to wear, not show your knees right. in that culture as a woman. So I, he's like, all right, let's go. I take off, you know, I had shorts on, took off my skirt and all the men were like, oh my God, <laughs> what? do we do yeah what just walked upon us right now (laughs) what do we do we've been taught our whole lives we've seen that we're when we see a woman's knees this is like this is an r-rated movie right right right. you know what are we supposed to do yeah and they have this man who works for the federation who's this respected man saying no this is a coach Mm -hmm. and we're gonna work with her and so just this within minutes of playing with them, coaching them, they changed the way they looked at me. Mm -hmm. They changed the way 
they talk to me. They're asking me questions about soccer. They're, you know, when you when you meg them, yeah. <laughs> they're know, like, they, whoa, they see the world a whole different way. And yeah. so just sit, like that hope that maybe they'll go back to their family and look at their sister a different way or their mother a different way. Um, and that idea of a coach can really change the way a young generation sees yes. um, the world. I would say that that one was like, okay, Lisa, your life is changing. Get yeah. Ready. <laughs> that moment was big. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I can totally, I, I can relate. I can re- definitely relate. Um, when uh, I was in Zambia in with coaches across continents, similar thing. It's we walk in and there's no women, all men just they're sitting out and we walk up and they looked at us like cross-eyed and sideways like who the hell are you (laughs) Mm -hmm. but by the end of the week it was they didn't want us to leave Mm because you know that that network of friends and the passion and the shared knowledge and and everything and and it's just breaking down you know stereotypes in many Mm -hmm. ways And, and you know the reverse that you know like we walk in you know you might walk into another country with a certain stereotype and it's just, you know, people are people. And that's, I think yep. that's the, the, the thing that, that I love personally about traveling internationally through soccer is talk to any coach. They're proud of their players. They want mm-hmm. to, they want to show off their team. They want to talk to you about how all the awesome things that they have done. And it's like coaches, coaches and players like, they're, they're the same everywhere. You know, you get into, Hey, let's talk about the world cup or let's talk about the European championships. And it's the same passion in any country. You could, you mm-hmm. could, you could be anywhere in the world and you could talk about football slash soccer and it's the same, you know? So that, mm-hmm. that that's, yeah. that's the thing that I just <laughs> hold on to and find so inspiring as we go. Awesome, Lisa. Well, we are winding down. So are there any shout outs that you want to give out to anyone? And are there any social media handles that you want people to look at? Or your um, do you have a website for the Growing the Game for Girls or anything that you want to promote? Sure, definitely a shout out to Linda, Linda Hamilton. Yes. I mean, amazing person, amazing role model. And now, um, my buddy from Vietnam, I would say, yes, um, yes. for this chance to talk to you, I appreciate, you know, what you're doing. Thank it's you. really important to give us all, you know, a voice and a platform to, to, to share our experiences. So thanks for what you're doing. And, um, I think to all the people that have mentored me, it's really amazing. Um, try to take them with me wherever I go, although they don't get the frequent flyer miles, but, <laughs> um, yeah, all those people that have have mentioned during this hour are are just amazing people and doing amazing things and inspire me. Um, in terms of our website, we just have uh, we work off of our Facebook page, so okay. growing the game for girls, and it it's a logo that is black and white, and we have a round ball. Um, this was inspired by Dr. Jensen Lee's concept of a ball brings people together, and then for us, the tree represents that one generation plants a seed. So the next Mm. generation enjoys the fruit. I love that. Um, Yeah. So that idea of giving back um, and just being simple about the game is, is about for our Facebook page and you can see pictures of everything we do and we're doing. Um, And then um, we do have Twitter and Instagram. um, And then for me, I have, um, uh, Lisa MN soccer is, you know, my handle okay. on, on Twitter. So, um, there are, yeah, chances to hear our voice and I'm totally open to talking to people and connecting and consulting and just making new friends like we've done today. Right. Well, it's been amazing to, <laughs> to meet you. And, and like I said, we have all these mutual friends and, and, um, you and I are going to talk offline because, I can't wait to get set up with Majida in Uganda. And Mm -hmm. thanks for for all you're doing for girls and boys and and coaches, male and female out there. Um, You know, keep on instructing, keep on sharing your knowledge. And, you know, it's been awesome to, to meet you and to have you on the show. And I can't wait to 
hear about all the, the great things that are coming for you and, and because of all the work that you're doing. So thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you calling in today and um, I will talk to you soon. Thank you for having me, Carrie. Yeah, Bye-bye. no problem. So thanks for tuning in to Women Talking Football. You can check us out on our website at www.womentalkingfootball.com, on Twitter at WotalkFootball, and on our Facebook page at Women Talking Football. Again, I want to thank Soccer Nation and Soccer Loco and Kings Pro for supporting all that we do here for Women Talking Football. Um, Thanks for tuning in, and we will talk to you next Tuesday. Have a good night. I don't know. I, I'm 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 partial to soccer because I'm passionate about it. I know when I was growing up, we didn't have strong, confident female role models. I followed my big brother around. He's two years older than me, and. Whether it was playing street hockey, tackle football, you name it, I was always on his heels dying to get in the game. Say you're going in the wrong direction (laughs) because it was halftime and we switched our our direction and I'd forgotten about that. (laughs) And uh, I was on this like dead, like, you know, breakaway. You can get five coaches in the same room and we all thought five different opinions on maybe how Kerry Taylor was as a player. I was a great I was a great player. And then when I got off the field, she would say, You did so great, I loved watching you play. No matter I could have the worst game of my life. And it was the president of the soccer deaf soccer association asking if I'd be interested in the in the volunteer job that was the head head coach of the deaf team. And I actually was extremely excited. I'm Carrie Taylor, and this is Women Talking Football.